Hey, hello and welcome everyone to our session today on Let's Code Together. My name is Dr. Samina Qureshi and I'm an International Medical Officer with the MSSO. I, along with my colleague Nicole, will be your instructors today. Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Fornerado, and I'm a clinical associate with the MSSO and also a trainer. I'm based in northern New Jersey uh, in the New York City metropolitan area. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. Now, in addition to Nicole, uh, we will also be joined by Liz Thomas, who you may have heard a few minutes ago. She's going to be helping facilitate today's webinar. Now, in order to be interactive with you, we will be using the Poll F software. The instructions to join, as Liz mentioned before, are in the chat section of your GoToMeeting control panel. Now, throughout the presentation, I will be prompting you uh, to join, log in, so you can participate in our various coding exercises that we have prepared for you today. Uh, one other point I'd like to make is that the question and answer portion that we're going to have throughout this session, as well as towards the end, is intended to answer questions about the principles that we discussed today. And it's not meant for general coding questions, such as challenging verbatims you may have encountered in your job. Um, so we will also be using the Medra web-based browser for exercises, and uh, just for today, we have provided you a training ID and password that you can use in case you've forgotten your password of your organization. Now, this password and ID, I will sh uh, put it, share it with you on the screen in the presentation. As well, you can find it in the chat section for your reference. Now, one other reminder that this particular session today is going to last 90 minutes. And in the uh, unlikelihood that we don't get through with all of the exercises, we will carry over those that remain in our next English session of Let's Code Together webinar. Okay, so with that, let's uh, move forward and start. Okay, so before we begin, I think it's very important for some of you who may be joining one of our uh, webinars for the very first time, it's very important to know what the acronym MEDRA stands for. So although the majority of you may know, just for the benefit of newcomers, I'd like to reiterate that the acronym stands for the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. And just a little brief uh, background on MEDRA terminology itself. MEDRA is an ICH initiative and the ICH, or the International Council for Harmonization, adopted the development of MEDRA in about the mid-1990s. Now, since MEDRA is an ever-breathing, living, and evolving terminology, the ICH appointed the MSSO, or the MEDRA Maintenance and Support Services Organization, the task to maintain and further develop the terminology based on user feedback, as well as to provide training, like the one you're attending today, and administer MEDRA licenses. Now, all of these MSSO activities are overseen by the ICH MEDRA Management Committee. Now, the MEDRA Management Committee in itself is composed of various industry and regulatory bodies, with the WHO acting as an observer. Okay. Now, for those of you who are veterans and have attended our other suite of webinar sessions, you know that before every presentation, we are required to review our disclaimer and copyright notice. It looks very verbose, but I'll try my best to summarize it for you. So in the very first bullet of our disclaimer notice is that MEDRA is owned by the ICH. We'd like to emphasize that all of the material presented today is also copyrighted material and owned by the ICH. Now, one uh, good point about this is, is that aside from the logos, all of the material presented today can be used by you in your organization, but if any change or modifications are made, you must make a disclaimer and acknowledge that those changes are in no way supported by the ICH. Now, the second bullet is uh, basically legal lingo and best read as such. So the presentation is provided as is without warranty of any kind. In no event shall the ICH or the authors of the original presentation be liable for any claim, damages, or other liability arising from the use of the presentation. And thankfully, the third bullet is not relevant for us today because we're not using any third party material in this presentation. 
So now with that very verbose slide out of the way, I'd just like to touch upon a few other things. Uh, we would like to let you know that the you, the participants, you can use the chat panel to ask questions throughout the presentation. And those questions that we don't get to within the session itself, we will certainly follow up with you within the, uh, to your email. Now again, with, uh, with an endeavor and a training of this nature, there will be times where you may not agree with the answers that we propose, but just for the uh, sake of time, in the interest of time, let's just agree to disagree because we may not all 100% agree on the solutions that we suggest to you. And again, like I said uh, at the beginning, we can't take specific verbatim strings uh, in the chat or the Q&A session. We want to answer questions that you may have regarding the principles that we discuss today. Now, one other thing we do uh, encourage and we welcome uh, suggestions from you for different uh, scenarios, concepts, or verbatim strings, or coding challenges that you have. You can certainly suggest those in the chat, or towards the end, we will uh, dedicate some time in order to get those from you. And then we will incorporate those suggestions in an upcoming future Let's Code Together session, because after all, this is for the user's uh, benefit. Okay, so let's get started and get you familiar with the Poll Everywhere platform that we're going to be using today. Now, either you can join using an internet browser on your laptop, your uh, tablet, or even your phone. Use this URL, www.pollev.com and uh, forward slash Nicole F. After you do that, this will take you to the Poll F platform and don't, you, need, you don't need to enter any username, you will be connected. Now, one other thing, please don't be shy when you pick answers, uh, you know, when you participate in Polab, because all of these answers are anonymized. We don't know who's giving which answer. So no, no need to be shy about uh, giving your answers in Polab. Okay, now for those of you who are using your cell phones, the one advantage is you can use your cell phone camera and use this QR code to directly take you to the Polab uh, platform site. Okay, so I'll give everyone uh, a few seconds. Again, the directions for logging in are also available to you throughout the session for your reference in the chat section of the control panel. So let's all log into Poll F, either with your phone camera, if you're using your cell phone, or here is the way to use it if you're using a browser, internet browser, on your tablet or computer. Okay, give you a few seconds to join. Okay, so here is our first, if you're all logged in, what you should be seeing is this globe. I'd like you to answer, good. So I, I see lots of people have joined and they're able to answer. Can you tell me where you are joining from today? Okay, so Nicole, you're going to have to help me with my geography a little bit. I do know a lot of people are showing up in the U.S. on the eastern states, some on the west, western, some in the middle. Okay, so we have representation from all regions of the U.S. We oh, have... That looks like Samina. We have Mexico. Yeah. Canada. Some in Canada. Yeah. India. Africa. Europe. Yeah. Looks wow. like maybe Iceland. No. Is that ice? No, um, the Greenland area. <laughs> Maybe a little bit on the water. They're still trying to oh, wait there. towards shore. Oh, they disappeared. Okay. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So we, we have a global, truly we have a global representation of uh, attendees today. So wonderful. Welcome everyone. So it's different uh, times of the day. So thank you very much for taking time out in your day to join us morning, evening, night. Wonderful. Okay, so let's see, now that we know where you're joining from, if we go to the next poll question. Okay, so now we want to know what role do you perform within your organization? So I see some people have answered already. And these are different roles. You either work for a regulatory authority, you have a specific role as a reviewer, safety physician, analysts, 
don't we don't have any IT professionals showing up yet. We have some in academia, uh, some as statisticians, biometrics professionals. The majority, at Nicole, I see are um, over 50% are medical coders or you, they oversee medical coding activities within their organization. So actually, the, uh, the specific kind of audience that's very interested in what we're going to do today. Yep. Good. Uh, about a quarter of you are reviewers, safety physicians, or clinical physicians. So good. We have varied backgrounds from various parts of the globe. Excellent. Okay, so thank you very much for your participation. Now we know you're able to log in. We know your answers are visible to us. So similarly, we're going to ask for your input and your uh, uh, coding guesses in our various exercises that we have prepared for you today. Okay. Move on along. I'm going to the next slide. Here I'm telling you the options. Uh, of, again, we mentioned in the beginning, you have different options you may use if you already have your Medra desktop browser. You may also use the Medra web-based browser, and here's the URL for that. Uh, as well, you may use the mobile Medra browser on your phone. I will actually be demonstrating my uh, examples and my searches in the web-based browser. And again, we have a training, temporary training user ID as well as password available to you in the chat section. And I will also put it up here. Now, Nicole, if you could uh, show users, if they don't want to type in that long URL, how to get to our homepage, the medra.org webpage. If you go sure. to the medra.org webpage, Sure. So what, what everyone could do, if you don't want to type it in, you can go to www.medra.org. I had it up, but I'll just, oh, I didn't retype wrong. There you org. Go. And then what you'll do here is just click the WBB up in the top. And you can, I my information's already safe because obviously I'm, helping to facilitate this class and then you can pull up the browser that way and use the temporary password and username that was provided. Yeah, so once you get to that, you push the, either you type in the URL or you get to it from our website like Nicole just demonstrated. You use our username, which we are using uh, today for your benefit. Training is the username and the password as you see on the screen, 722 at P-E-R-A-M-E capital D. So we'll give you a few minutes just so you're on the ready, ready to attend and ready to log in and browse along with me. And again, okay. anytime you need, you can reference it in the chat section. Yeah, and Samina, while people are taking a second to log in here, um, since we know the poll everywhere works, we did receive a question um, from someone asking where they can access the slides. And I just thought it would be good if we address it now. So we're not, we didn't provide the slides ahead of time and we're not gonna be providing the slides um, after the session. However, this session is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. So you can access it anytime um, at your convenience um, and listen to pieces of it or the whole thing again, go through the examples if you wanna just see one, more, one example again. And we'll give instructions for how to get there towards the end of the presentation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Nicole, for addressing that. We will, towards the end, show you uh, where the recorded session, today's recorded session, will be available. It should be available within a few days of the conclusion of today's session. Okay, so hopefully everyone has logged in just to see that they can log in, either using your organization's username and password or the one we've provided for today. Okay. Let's go back. Okay, so let's sort of uh, get into the meat of the matter. Now, as you know, medical coding provides, you know, presents with several challenges. Sometimes the concept that you're looking for, or the term you're looking for, an exact match isn't always available. That's where you should have in your mind sort of like a decision tree on how to approach such type of a concept. Now, we do have the points to consider document that those of you who are veteran Medra users are familiar with. That's a great reference to tell you how to approach various coding challenges. It gives you a preferred option as well as an alternate op alternative op option. 
Now, once, once you're presented with a coding scenario, a coding narrative, or a coding verbatim, it's very important to first think and interpret the data that's given to you. And again, in an important take-home message is you should never as assume anything about the information given, given to you. Just code the amount of information that's given to you. Don't do additional assumptions and code something extra. At, on the same token, don't uh, neglect to capture something that is being reported. Now, oftentimes the options, there are several options that can be presented in some scenarios and you don't know which approach to take. So the best uh, method is to represent events by the best approximation of what's being reported if there is no exact match term available to you in Medra. Now here's something I'd like to sort of show users. Now when you look at this picture, many people with different perspectives, with different insights will interpret this picture totally different. Now I see something, but before I tell you what I see in this very colorful uh, picture, Nicole, what do you see here? Oh, uh, I look at this and I, you know, I think I'm just bad at these. <laughs> but what I see is a frog, actually. It's like I see frog legs and, and uh, some eyes and it looks like a frog with a fish head. So, Samina, I'm not sure interesting, that's interesting. even close in, in the ballpark of what you're seeing, but... <laughs> I, I actually see a very friendly uh, finned fish. So, I don't know what pond that Nicole lives near where the frogs look like that, but I see a fish. So, so just as an example between the two of us colleagues, we see something totally different. So I see a fish, you know, a very colorful, rare, exotic, colorful fish, and Nicole sees a frog. But in actuality, if you really take a deeper look, you look at it, you analyze it very closely, it actually is an artist who's painted a person. A body is painted and folded to look like a fish. So if you look very closely at the fins, those are two feet that have been painted to look like a colorful tail, fish tail. So it, this just proves the point that depending on which angle you look at, depending on which perspective, what experience, like Nicole's seen a lot of frogs looking like this, your experience you see different things and you can interpret the data differently as well as we interpreted this picture differently. Yeah. So and just food for it. thought. And Samina, it's important to note, right, neither are wrong, it's just a different way of looking at it, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's why we, we at the very outset said, let's agree to disagree. So Nicole and I are not fighting with each other, so we're still on friendly terms. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, it's sticking for some reason. Okay. Now again, we want to emphasize that um, you must use your medical judgment when you are approaching any type of verbatim and narrative. You have to keep a very nuanced balance between the coding rules that exist in your coding conventions and within your organization, as well as the, the need and the desire to remain consistent, as well as keeping your medical judgment in mind and making sure that the concept that's being reported is correctly and adequately uh, captured. Now, of course, since we're not all experts in every field and science is an ever-evolving subject, it sometimes become very, it becomes very necessary to make use and uh, confer with medical references uh, in order to take a deeper dive and have a better understanding of the concept that's being reported. So I would always recommend, and that we will demonstrate that to you in our upcoming examples, that sometimes making, making use of your medical references helps you make the correct coding choice. Okay, now uh, in addition, I'd also like to mention that sometimes you try your level best, but still you cannot find the concept that you're looking for uh, adequately or clearly enough in MEDRA. So in those unique situations, it may be necessary for you to request a new term addition to MEDRA. And the best way to do that is to submit a change request and request a particular specific concept to be added. And of course you can do that correctly using our web CR tool. And we have various sessions and presentations going into detail on how to do that correctly. Okay. Now here I mentioned very briefly before when I'm, I was talking to you about how to approach coding that it's very important to have internal conventions. Now these conventions will sort of provide a framework, a framework for everyone within the organization 
in a proper way to handle the data consistently. So as you know, various uh, teams, coding teams specifically, have varying levels of experience uh, and varying levels of expertise in different therapeutic areas. So in order for everyone to code consistently, it's important to have internal conventions. Now the conventions shouldn't be so specific uh, that they can only be honed in on one particular therapeutic area. They should be general enough that they can be applied among various therapeutic areas. And of course, the whole point is to alleviate ambiguity with terms. Now there's different types of uh, conventions that organizations may have internally. For example, there are some conventions that address case management and processes. Others uh, deal with clinical data management. And of course, for our purposes today, what I'd like to emphasize is internal coding conventions that tell you how to approach various scenarios consistently. Now one thing, other uh, one other point I'd like to make is it's important to keep your internal coding conventions updated. I would recommend looking at them with every new Medra version release just to see if there are any new terms, uh, new concepts added in this particular new Medra version that may be applicable to your verbatims that you come across consistently. And perhaps a new term addresses a better solution than what you have memorialized in your conventions. Okay, so now we have touched upon that. Now I think we are ready to go into our coding. Let's code together. Okay, so let's start with our very first example. I will do the initial few examples and then I will turn it over to Nicole and she'll conclude the session with her remaining examples. So we are set with you knowing, we know everyone knows how to log into the browser and to perform these searches to provide answers. And once I give you the various prompts, you can go into poll ev and I'll prompt you and type in what you think is the correct answer. So our very first verbatim, here's a, just a brief uh, a verbatim string in the blue box. She had hard time maintaining sleep once she fell asleep, would wake up in middle of night. So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, is this verbatim clear enough to code? Sometimes you'll be presented with just two words, three words, or a sentence that doesn't really make much sense. And then in those rare occasions where you just can't make any rhyme or reason of what's given to you, you may need to query if that's an option, a possible option in your organization. Again, look hard at what is being reported, what is in your ver verbatim string or your narrative, and see what are they trying to tell me? Which anatomical part are they talking about? In this case, they're talking about something about her sleep. She has a hard time maintaining the sleep once she does fall asleep and she wakes up in the middle of the night. So automatically, you know, even if I'm not too familiar with Medra and all the LTs that are in there, I have some sort of idea that I'm going to look at some sleep terms perhaps, uh, you know, because this has something to do with uh, uh, inability to maintain sleep or some sort of difficulty in sleeping. Okay, so let's uh, everyone log into your browser, whichever type you've chosen to use today, your web-based browser, your desktop browser, or your phone browser. I will be using the desk, uh, I'm sorry, the web-based browser. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I now I know in my own thought process that I'm going to look for some type of, she has some type of sleep difficulty. Well, I, I guess I'll start off with insomnia. Okay. Now I'm looking at insomnia and then I see in my search that I see, okay, the exact match insomnia comes up, which goes to PT insomnia. Uh, but I have all these different uh, term LLTs with insomnia. When I open them up, I see that, well, that this is also, this LLT chronic insomnia goes to PT insomnia, initial insomnia. Here's a unique medical concept. It's different from plain insomnia. It's called initial insomnia. So that means there's some difference between initial insomnia and the plain insomnia. I see another interesting term, middle insomnia, and I keep going down and seeing all the various insomnia types that are unique medical concepts at PT level. Here's one that's terminal insomnia. There's one transient insomnia, but it's again housed under insomnia. So let me look, right click, go to the browser, and open up 
the plain insomnia and see what's under it. Okay, so here we have insomnia PT. Look at all these LLTs under the uni under the PT insomnia. Difficulty sleeping. So for those of you who didn't at the out outset think of insomnia, even if you had typed in difficulty sleeping, it it would have taken you to the PT insomnia. There's insomnia disorder, insomnia exacerbated, insomnia NOS, primary insomnia. So I, I am getting myself familiar with the various LLT under the PT insomnia. But then I'm interested to see the other types of middle insomnia. So before I do that, I'm going to go back. I'm going to minimize my browser. And I'm going to go to my reference. I want to read up because I wasn't aware that there was a more, more than one type of insomnia. So this is the point where I would go to my references. As I mentioned before, we're not all experts in all therapeutic areas. And sometimes you don't know everything about a particular disease or pathology. So in my Medscape reference that I wanted to refer to, I see that insomnia actually is divided into three different types, initial insomnia, middle insomnia, and terminal insomnia. Now for, for the interest of time, I'm going to hone in on what sort of fits the definition of what was reported to me in my verbatim string. She had a difficulty in maintaining sleep, right? So middle insomnia actually is defined as difficulty in maintaining sleep. Decreased sleep efficiency is present with fragmented unrestful sleep and frequent waking during the night. And that's what happened to the lady in our verbatim. She would wake up uh, in the middle of the night. So I'm uh, leaning towards this. So I'm going to go back to my browser and I'm going to look under middle insomnia in the browser. Okay, so here's middle, PT middle insomnia. I'm going to right click open in the browser to look at all the LLTs under it. So here's an LLT that kind of describes exactly what I, I sort of had in my verbatim. Arousal night, middle insomnia, nocturnal awakening, sleep maintenance insomnia. Remember they said she had trouble going to sleep. So I think this is sort of driving me in the right direction. Okay, so let's go to our poll Ev. I'll minimize this and go to my poll ev slide. All right, for those of you with a phone camera, here's your QR code just for your reference to take you to poll ev. And let's see what the audience thinks. What should be the LLT for this particular? Okay. Well, Samina, if it's okay, while um, people are responding to this um, poll, we did have a couple. Um, comments, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, relating to this exercise. So some people are suggesting sleep maintenance insomnia. So I'm not sure if you want to touch upon that. Um, and then I'll get to the other ones. There was one about the poll in general and the reason why it didn't change. And that's because when we bring up a new poll, you'll get the poll on your on your phone or your desktop, whatever you're working on. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah, so, so we did get comments of sleep maintenance insomnia. Okay, so let's go to the browser and see where, where that LLT resides, sleep maintenance insomnia. So from the choices that I gave you in the poll, you're absolutely right. If that LLT was there, sleep maintenance insomnia, we would have picked that. What we see, this LLT is under the PT middle insomnia. So from the choices that are given to you from in the answers, that's what we would say, middle insomnia. But the most accurate LT, if the person is very correct, would be sleep maintenance insomnia. But they're all housed under middle insomnia PT. Very good point. Okay, excellent. This is exactly the type of uh, the, exactly the type of feedback that we want. Quite, you know, we and the point is that we, you know, have. PT and the LT resides under that particular PT that we have from among the choices, answer choices. Okay. So excellent. This was this is very nicely done and good point brought up by the audience. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay. So here just this is the first exercise. So we're getting the gist of how to use our references, how to use our browser, how to look at the choices that we have to choose from, and how the most perfect LT may reside under the PT. 
Okay, so again, use references for topic information. I didn't know before this uh, checking with my reference that there was a subclassification in subtypes of insomnia and one middle insomnia that fit exactly the verbatim. As well, I looked at the browser, took use and leveraged the search capability of it, looked at all the LLTs under a particular PT. And of course, if applicable uh, and if it's challenging, you may have internal conventions around a particular concept. In our case, this was pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's move on to the next example. Oh, just, just for everyone's record, the correct answer is LLTPT, middle insomnia, for this particular exercise. Okay, so here's something uh, sort of funny and creepy. Um, Selena, sorry, before we move on, do you mind if we, because uh, somebody's asking, you okay. know how you provided a great reference for that, like to mm -hmm. find middle insomnia, they're asking where can they go to to find, to access some references. So usually uh, in part of internal conventions or generally speaking, some organizations actually recommend two or three uh, references, either for definitions or for, you know, searching various pathologies, disease conditions. And we typically uh, say, you know, you can even do a simple Google search if your organization has not, you know, recommended any one in particular. You can do a Google search, look up the particular concept that you're looking for. Typically, we use Mayo Clinic, we use Medscape. For uh, medical definitions, we use Dorland's. But any of these, uh, any of the ones out there may be used. And if you don't have anyone in particular, you can do a Google search and use a very well, you know, highly known medical reference and search your particular topic. So there's no limitation to which one you can use or you can't use. Okay, so the comment came back. Um, they, they appreciate the response because they thought maybe there were um, references built into the Metro browser. So that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So the fact that we use medical references, that is totally independent of the browser or the functionalities of the browser. The browser only contains all of the terms in the Medra dictionary, the various hierarchies. Of course, in the browser, we also have medical concept descriptions available to you. And in the browser, in the web-based browser, we have various uh, functionalities. Um, um, uh, Nicole, if you can bring up the browser, please. Sure. And then while I'm doing this, uh, somebody else had a, a question to see the Medra reference once more. So I believe they're referring to the browser, but if they want to comment, um, I'll and certainly go say, back to that slide, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. So the Medra browser itself houses uh, the various, the web-based browser houses various uh, terminal, all of the terms in Medra terminology. You can go to various versions if you need to go to one before the, the most current one. Currently, for our purposes, we're using 25.0 today. The Medra browser also allows you to quickly go to the various Medra concept descriptions. This is the way particular terms are used within the scope and realm of Medra. So they're not definitions per se, they're concept descriptions. As well, we have legends. It shows you the various uh, color coordination, you know, the various meaning of the various colors around the PT, LLT, and so forth, SOC. It's a sort of a legend to tell you what each color means. We also have a quick, uh, access to the various Medra documentation. We talk about the PTC document. If you put uh, push that tab, it takes you to our web page and specifically to, takes you to our documentation page. Uh, in addition, we have a user guide on how to use the browser itself. We have a term search history, for example, insomnia. If I want to do a search history, it'll tell me when that particular term was, let's say insomnia, was added in the dictionary. So it tells me, see, initial insomnia was added in 2.1. Uh, insomnia non-organic was added as LLT in 2.1, and so forth. So you can use, you can leverage that information. So all the uh, tabs at the top have to do with the terminology itself and does not provide you references for pathologies or diseases, etc. Okay, so if we minimize that, and I'll go back to the slide where I used a reference. Okay. These were references that we pulled up ourselves. 
because these are the standard medical references that we typically use. Of course, we're not limited to one. Uh, you can use uh, Medscape, you can use uh, UpToDate, or any of the other ones that may be uh, more favored or recommended by your organization. But there's no limitation to what reference you can use. We just use Medscape because I think it illustrated uh, insomnia very nicely and concisely for purposes of our, of our presentation today. Typically, we do use uh, frequently the Dorland's Medical Dictionary for definitions for various concepts. So those are the two that I, you know, personally, not from an organizational perspective, but from my own personal perspective, I like to use. Okay. So very good questions. We really appreciate these questions because we do want to make it clear for you on how to approach these various scenarios. Yeah, and Samina, before you go to your next example, we do still have a couple more questions. So someone was asking, where do you find what codes are in the new different versions? Well, actually a list of the new codes, so not a search. So a list of new terms per each version. A list of new codes. So where do you find what codes are new in different versions? So I think there this is more in a versioning question than say, um, Okay. Yeah, we can, uh, for those that are, for those questions uh, that are not specifically related to the exercise, we can certainly absolutely return their specific question answer in, in an email if we run out of time at the end. Okay, so we'll touch upon the different codes uh, if we have time at the end, but um, yeah. other than that, there was one more question about how to access the referencing, but we, the references, but we just went through that, so I think we're okay. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so let's go to our second example, which I, which I started to tell you was a little creepy. So this is our second example. While on staycation, and I don't blame her because of the pandemic, she wanted to stay home. So she's on a staycation, a weird lizard bit her. So very simple, straightforward, you know, funny little verbatim string. Is this clear enough to code? I would suppose it kind of is because, you know, something very basic happened, a lizard bit her. What is being reported? A bite. What is the anatomical site? They really didn't tell us. So apparently, when we use the, uh, you know, when we search for the exact match code, we won't uh, address the site because it's not given. And what is the most appropriate LT? So I'm going to show you that how my thought process is going to work in the browser. Okay. So let's look at the browser. Wonderful. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, let me just start off. So I, I mean, you know, I do know it's a bite. So let me start off with the term bite and see what I have since I'm not super familiar with all the terms about bites. Okay, so I see there's 61 matches that have the word bite in it, but one exact match of just bite. Okay, I'm going to open that up. So let me see, uh, I'm going to highlight the PT bite, right click, go to the browser to see all the LLTs housed under that PT. Okay, Let's see here's the PT byte. I'm going to open it up and actually it doesn't really give me much anything closer to what's reported the lizard bit her. I just have bite, bite NOS, bite wound. Okay, so now I have that knowledge. These are the options I have under PT bite. So what are other types of bites that are here? There's an ant bite. No, obviously it wasn't an ant. Animal bite, well, yeah, it's a type of an animal. Arthropod bite, let me see what's under housed under arthropod bite. For future reference, it's good to know. I didn't know. Okay, look at this. Arthropod bite PT has several specific types of arthropods. They go into quite a bit of detail. Uh, ant bite, an arthropod bite, a bed bug bite, a centipede bite, a flea bite. So should I come in the future with these types of bites? I know that we are very specific about the arthropods. So for my future knowledge, it's good to know that we have lots of details under arthropod bite. But still doesn't help me for my today's verbatim, right? I, I don't see anything about lizard. So far, I only know about bite, okay? So let's look at what I'd like to do is I'd like now to go to the um, our poll before I give away the answer. So let's get rid of the browser for now, minimize it and go to our next slide. Okay, so those of you who still have the Medra browser open, maybe you can go do quick searches. I only opened up Arthropod Byte. Maybe you can do a little own search. 
So let's go into Poll Everywhere, everyone, and see what you think for this exercise. Which LLT would you select? And if, and if you select the LLT, make sure it's in, in Medra. Maybe it's a trick question. Make sure the LLT you choose is in Medra. Okay, so um, uh, a few of you will, would choose animal bite, correct, because it is an animal versus a bite. That's more specific, so I'm glad people didn't pick bite. They pick either animal bite or they pick lizard bite. Okay, so let's go back to our browser. And so those of you who said animal bite, let's see what's under animal bite. Animal bite LLT goes to PT animal bite. I'm going to right click, go to my browser, and see what kind of animals are listed. And under PT animal bite, I see animal bite NOS, cat bite, dog bite, and lo and behold, those of 92% of you actually looked and you saw that there is a specific LLT lizard bite. So you you get you get the ribbon today. You want lizard bite is the correct choice. Very good. So we persisted, we opened up the PT and we looked and there is an exact match LLT that serves our purpose. Very good. So lizard bite is the correct answer. 94% of you get the ribbon today and that's the correct answer. So while on staycation, she didn't have fun. Instead, she got bit by a lizard. Okay. So any questions on that one before I move on to the next one? No questions. Okay, good. All right, so here we are going to go to our third example. If, okay, there we go. So here we're, we're, it's a little bit more complex than a simple lizard bite. Here we have the ilioanal anastomosis was performed for his drug-resistant ulcerative colitis. Again, our decision tree or in our mind we think, okay, what I'm given, is this clear enough to code? Well, yes, because they're describing some sort of surgical procedure, ilioanal anastomosis. This was done, and they're giving us information, like he had a diagnosis of drug resistance ulcerative colitis. Okay, so that's what basically is being reported. Anatomical site, well, we know it's, you know, the ilioanal uh, sections were anastomosed together. Now I have to look for the most appropriate LLT. Okay, and I may have to do a little research because I'm not really a surgeon, so I don't know too much about specific uh, uh, procedures or surgeries in that particular anatomical area. Okay, so again, I'm going to take use, make use of my references. And here's one, another one of my fav personal favorites. The Mayo Clinic has very nice uh, descriptions. I looked up what ilioanal anastomosis is, and I see that in parentheses it's also known as J-pouch surgery. So ilioanal anastomosis, commonly called J-pouch surgery, allows you to eliminate waste normally after removal of your entire large intestine, colon, and rectum. So it's basically taking the ilium and directly connecting it to the anal canal with the other in-between parts of the gut removed. Now, the procedure avoids the need for a permanent opening in the abdomen for passing bowel movements, okay? And then there's the indications on why it's done. It's most often used to treat chronic ulcerative colitis. And as you know, that's what was given in our verbatim string. It's used to treat chronic ulcerative colitis and inherited conditions such as familial adenomatous polyposis. And that carries a high risk in itself, as you know, of colon and rectal cancer. So in some instances, the procedure is done when medications used to treat ulcerative colitis fail to control the condition. And that is exactly the scenario and the backdrop of what occurred in our verbatim. Okay, so now I have this added knowledge of what is a synonym of anal anastomosis, when it's done, and the most likelihood uh, of, of scenarios in the backdrop in which they do this. Okay, so let's use, make use of our browser, whichever one you're using. Let's go to our my browser and I'll do the search for you, with you. Uh, first of all, the most easiest thing is, let me just type in what they gave me. Perhaps I'll get lucky and it's in there, all right? So I'm gonna look up ilioanal in order to capture the procedure, ilioanal. Maybe I'll have it, maybe I'll have to use some synonym, who knows? 
Okay, so I got lucky and okay, great. So there is a specific exact match LLT for what happened in my verbatim string of ilioanal anastomosis, which is ha housed under the broader PT concept of intestinal anastomosis. And I'm just going to, for interest, open it up in the browser to increase my familiarity with that concept. And here we see all the various LLT housed under that PT concept of intestinal anastomosis. It's also called ilioanal pouch, the LLT we're looking for, exact match ilioanal anastomosis, as well as you can see, it's interesting, they even have the LLT of the synonym of what it's known as J-pouch surgery. So I have all this knowledge now of the specific LLTs underneath this PT, but of course I have the exact match that I'm looking for, LLT ilioanal anastomosis. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. Here's your QR code. Time to join another poll of quiz question. Again, don't worry. You can answer however you wish. It's anonymized. We won't know who made what choice. So among all the choices, which, which LLT or LLTs would you select? Okay, 69% of you would use choice A, which is ilioanal anastomosis, which is the surgical procedure that was performed, as well as the diagnosis or the indication for which he had it done, his ulcerative colitis. And some of you would use the uh, broader concept PT of intestinal anastomosis. Okay, so let's look at, before we go to the correct answer, I'd like to sort of point to our points to consider PTC document, the Medra Term Selection PTC document. Now here, I, I was sort of conflicted on whether I should use choice A, which had both the procedure and the diagnosis, or just with the procedure. So in my PTC document, this particular scenario is specifically addressed. If a procedure is reported with a diagnosis, the preferred option is to select terms for both the procedure and the diagnosis. Now, for those of you who only picked uh, in your in your poll of the procedure, you're not incorrect. But from among the two, the PTC says the preferred one would be answer A, which has both the diagnosis as well as the procedure. Okay, so the correct answer was the first one. And I kind of was conflicted, uh, so I used and referred to my points to consider document, and it showed me which one was the preferred option. Okay, so before we move on, I didn't pick drug resistance alone. That was one of the choices in our poll of, um, uh, question. I didn't pick drug resistance. I wasn't sure, so I went to my trusted resource, the Dorland's Medical Dictionary, and drug resistance as such is defined here. Although my, uh, you know, ulcerative colitis is drug resistant, but in itself, standalone, choosing drug resistance would be incorrect. Had it uh, been drug resistant ulcerative colitis, then I would have leaned towards picking that. Okay, so here's the whole thought process. You check your references, you check for the best match or a synonym if there's no exact match in your browser. You look at the choices you have, at least for the poll F questions, and pick what is the best choice. And if you are in doubt, try to look in your points to consider document to see if your very, that specific coding scenario has been addressed. Okay, so the correct choice or the correct answer is uh, A, which was LLT ilioanal anastomosis and LLT ulcerative colitis based on the preferred option given in our points to consider document. Okay. Okay, so Samina, um, there questions? are some, there's a question, yeah. There okay. was a question about drug resistance, but you nicely answered that in your slides. You must have anticipated it. Yes. So, <laughs> Always good. And then um, there was a question, there was a comment question. It says, in the case that is an AE, you definitely would want the medical condition and treatment as secondary, correct? Like asking you if, would you want that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so it, the question is, in the case that it's an AE, you definitely would want the medical condition coded, I guess, and the treatment as secondary. Correct, but in, in this case, yeah, you're right. The surgical procedure was done and the, it was performed as well as the 
you know, this was the indication for it. This was what, or the diagnosis. He was diagnosed with drug-resistant ulcerative colitis, and then this surgery was performed. So both would be captured. Okay, and then somebody's asking about two LLTs to use here, question mark. So meaning, I guess, maybe um, you could, maybe they're speaking to a system where maybe you can only code one LLT. So in that case, yeah, that's that's so that's a very good point that they brought up, and I appreciate that. There are some limitations, uh, you know, especially uh, for clinical trial uh, organizations. They have limitations on their forms where they can only pick one LLT, and we've come across that a lot. So yes, yeah, some of our answers, you know, we have two LLTs, but it's not always uh, possible in throughout all organizations. That's that's a commonly known challenge. Yeah, and then Samina, in that case, would you recommend to, they have to send a query to get it split so they could code both? Yes. If the organization warrants that. Right, or in this particular, in this particular scenario, ideally they could query and get an additional column to, you know, get two codes for that, or in this particular scenario, since the alternate option is to just code one term, they could go with that as well. It's not mm -hmm. the preferred option, but it is an acceptable option. Okay, and then uh, we just had one more comment that somebody does was confirming that they do query to split. So just so okay, so that's good. So yeah, yeah and good. see, it comes back to our frogfish, mm -hmm. <laughs> colorful pond where you know you may do things slightly differently, but in the end, the most important thing is that you frogfish or it. artist, very creative artist. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, I think that's it for the comments. So, thank you, Nicole. Okay, so let's see. We have the final for this one, and I, and I will come with my my final uh, uh, example and then I will hand it over to you. So before I hand it over to Nicole, here's our example four. There was erythema where her nicotine patch had been. Again, my decision tree or my thought process says, wait a minute, is this clear enough to code or is this something so vague that I have to query or is some, something nonsense where I can't make head or tail of it? But in this case, I think we have enough information here. There was erythema where her nicotine patch had been. So that's what's being reported, simply straightforward. Her nicotine patch was there, and she had redness or erythema. So what would be the most appropriate LLT? My, my brain starts to think, what LLT am I going to look for? Which area am I specifically uh, honing in towards in my browser? And do I need to split? Okay. Oops, I think we went too fast. Okay. Now we have to think about it though. It may seem very straightforward, but we have to know how to appropriately, you know, capture the concepts in this, uh, in this uh, scenario. So let's go to the poll. Let's see what the poll, pe let's go this time directly to the poll question. So everyone, uh, tell me what you think would be the answer. And I think I, can, Nicole, I think I can skip this one because everyone got the answer right well. Okay, so I shouldn't speak so soon. Yeah, while this poll is going to, um, somebody did say, uh, going back to the last example, that they asked their investigators to split, but it doesn't always work out, which is very true, as we all know. Um, sometimes you query a term and it doesn't work out. So that's important to keep in mind, right, Samina? When you're Absolutely. Coding. And I really appreciate this feedback because we learn from one another. So um, like this uh, attendee answered, it's very good. There are sometimes limitations. Other times there is the option to request, you know, a, a splitting. So, you know, various organizations handle it differently. Okay, so here I think it's safe to say that 6% say just to code erythema. And the other 94% say, say application site redness. Okay, so let's go to our handy dandy reference. Okay. Okay, so I looked up transdermal medications just because I, you know, wasn't really sure, uh, you know, when, when you have patches, how do I address patches? You know, because pills you take, you ingest, injections, you know, you're injected into your arm. But what about a patch? How do you translate that into a term? So when I read up the whole, you know, um, reference, I saw administration, transdermal patches, administration should follow proper physical exam, I'm, I'm properly reading, you should disinfect, you should apply application of patch in the desired area. So here I'm getting that the way, when you talk about patches, they're applied, right? So this is giving me some hint. 
uh, of, of the way to refer to patches, administration of transdermal patches, depends on the drug administered by the patch. So I keep reading, apply, application. So these are terms that are sort of, you know, giving me little light bulbs. So that's how you refer to a patch. It's called application. Transdermal patches are the most common method of delivery for active substances. Transdermal patches can irritate the skin and cause pruritus, burns, and redness. So that's exactly what happened in our scenario. There was erythema at the site of the nicotine patch, right? And by reading this whole reference, I'm getting a gist that the way to properly refer to patches is application. They apply the patches. So that gives me a clue on how to look for the term in my browser. Okay, so that's actually what I was looking for. And if I go to the browser, um, if you can uh, pull up the browser, because the correct answer is application site redness. Now, for those of you who, who are not familiar, erythema and red, uh, redness are synonyms. So since one of the choices didn't say exactly erythema, but had the application part, so I chose a term with application site redness instead of erythema and that allowed me to capture the entire scenario in one term. So let's go away from the ileoanal, we're at the wrong part of the body and let's look at application because that's how patches are referred to. Okay, application. Let me just put in erythema. Maybe you know I'll get lucky. Okay, so application site erythema is there. Let me open up that PT and look at all the LLTs under there. Application site erythema opens up, let's see, and you have application site erythema as an LLT and you have application site redness. But because our slide or our choices that we were, the best LLT choice would be application site erythema. But since my poll F slide didn't have that as a choice, I only had the application site redness, and that is under that PT, of, then this would be the best choice from the available choices that I have in my answers. Okay, so if there are any questions, let me know, Nicole, on this particular one. Okay, so there were no questions, there was just a comment about application site erythema. Okay, good. And, and we, we showed you that since the, that would be the perfect answer, but since that wasn't in one of the choices, this is a synonym housed under the same PT. So conceptually, this is the correct choice as well. So I will now give you the honors, Nicole. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great, thanks. And thanks, Amina, for going through all those examples. So now we'll get to my first example. So my first one is face turned red. So upon looking at first glance of this term, it may seem to be a fairly simple example. So is it really a fairly simple example or could there be more to it? So would this term possibly need to be queried or flagged? So let's dive a little deeper to see what you all think. I'm gonna go straight into a quiz to give everybody an opportunity. There's the QR code in case you need it. But I have an open-ended, um, question here and I would like to get everyone's initial interpretation of face turned red. So just your initial thoughts, you could type whatever you want. Uh, where would you code it? Would you uh, query it? Does it seem straightforward? Is it more complicated? Um, what do you think? Okay, we're getting some face reds, redness of face, face red, LLT. Very good. Face redness, facial flushing. Okay, we got some flushing now. Would anybody think to um, query this term or would it be okay? You can type in, it's really free, free reign here. So you can type in whatever you feel. Okay, redness of face, red face, we'll give it another minute. Samina, are you su surprised by these responses? Probably not, right? No, because you know they're along the same lines, good. Yeah, yeah. all right, good. Facial redness, facial erythema. Okay, I'll give another minute for people to just type in. Okay, so it looks like everybody's in agreement here, or pretty much in agreement. We had the facial flushing, but let's, uh, let's take a little bit of a closer look. So I'm gonna just uh, move on to my next slide and let's, uh, let's browse this a little bit. So I'm gonna just bring over the browser. 
and see what we could come up with. So I saw a lot of people had um, face red. So we'll just pull that up. We'll go, we'll double click. And I am, just so everyone's aware, I'm using the desktop browser for this example. I know Samina was using the web-based browser. So just to give you a, a different look at um, our browser. So this is the desktop. So it's the same type of concept. If you, you could type in partial or full words and then scroll through and see if there's anything. That kind well, of frog, frog people like desktop, I guess. <laughs> Especially ones that, uh, you know, frogs in the Caribbean for me. But um, so there's red face, redness face, facial redness of face. So we, we came over here and we right clicked and we went to, the, we opened up, it's under erythema. So we see, okay, that looks like a great, a great fit, right? Do we need to look at anything else? I saw someone pulled up flushing. Let's, let's go there and see what that entails. Oh, okay, so there is a flush face. So we can, again, we can expand it here and see that goes to flushing. Because you know, when you, when you do get flushed, your face does turn red, right? So it could be something to think about. So facial flushing, you know, it's, it's there under flushing. Okay, so let's keep all this in mind. So it's what everybody, everybody found um, while they were providing their answers. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation. And now I would like everyone to use, I guess here, this is a little redundant since everyone did pull up LLTs the last time, um, but what LLT based off of what we just saw, did it change? Would you still go to redness and face? Is there a problem with the browser? I'm not sure. Okay, here we go. And while that's going, I do see that um, there are a couple people saying that there would be erythema versus flushing. So, and some people would query for the reason for redness. So you could type that in here too. If you feel a query needs to, to take place, you can, you can type that in and, and put what you would query. Um, really, like I said, I like to have a little more open discussion via the poll since we, we are all muted. Um, okay, so it still looks like everybody's staying with red face. Red face LLT. Okay, good. All right. Oh, what query? There we go to see if it's yeah. erythema or it flushing. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Samina, go ahead. No, I, I said the question came up in your poll. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so here's another person needing to query. See, the more we kind of, at first glance, you might say, okay, this is kind of simple. And then the more you think about it, you know, or, or the more people, the more minds you get um, kind of. Thinking about it, clarification for swelling, that's an interesting one. The red face, um, uh, face turned red. Okay, no change to LLT suggestion. Blushing is an interpretation. Okay, all right. So with that, I think we'll, we'll go back to the, the presentation. Seems most people are on the same page with this. So since the turn state's face turned red, some organizations may opt to query this. And that, that basically, that, that's what came up towards the end. So this would depend on your internal coding conventions and also depend on your organization's products, right? So we always should check the meaning of the term and use the measure context and then check if the term can be interpreted in multiple ways. So red face turn red may come up and you know, you may be dealing with uh, an allergy pill or something to that extent and, and your organization may need to flag that to look into it a little further, right? So, so we would check the browser to see if we find an exact match and then try to capture all of the information. Like, as we mentioned, red face may need to be organized. So here we can ask ourselves, just to get different perspectives on a term like this, do you simply code to a single LLT? Or is this maybe an adverse event of special interest or something that needs to be flagged based off of your product pipeline, um, you know, your therapeutic areas that you're involved in? So the key word here is that the face turned red. Do we need to know why? I mean, some people would say, no, we do not just code it to face red and we're done, you know? And other organizations may need to look at it a little further as we mentioned. So another thing to keep in, Samina, yes, did you? Say? Yeah, I had a comment uh, in, the, in the question pane. Yep. Um, so someone's just making a comment that the reviewer is a stickler for not using a symptom and confirming if a diagnosis is available. So just a comment. Okay, all right. Yep, see, it's good to get all the information. So these are things that you can keep in mind 
um, while you're coding and when you receive a term like this, it's always important, even if something seems simple, to try to look at it from, from not only your perspective, but from maybe others' perspectives as well, right? So another item to keep in mind is, are you working in clinical versus post-marketing? And this is something that came up in Samina's example where somebody suggested that, you know, they can't code two LLTs, they would have to query that. And in a clinical setting, it, it would be, you know, more important where you have to go in, you have to send a query if this needed to be clarified or split. And in a post-marketing setting, you may have a narrative or source docs that you may be able to work off of to find out a little more information around why the face turned red, which in the end may be able to be appended to the term, right? So with that being said, the final suggestion here is we always should code to the closest LLT to the verbatim provided. So in this case, how I interpreted it is that the face turned red, and although we don't know why or how the face turned red, the closest LLT to this term without querying would be face red. However, as I mentioned, um, some medications may cause flushing, as, as one of our participants mentioned, may cause allergy. It may be, um, the, maybe the patient has a history of rosacea. Maybe the patient got sunburned, whereas you also can consider that some medications may cause a sensitivity to light which may then in turn make the patient more, um, more kind of uh, conducive to getting sunburn or being out in the light may cause a sunburn more easily. So these are just things to keep in mind. So again, it's very specific to your organization, something where, okay, we see that face turned red. We see that there's a red face, it matches. It's a great LLT to use. However, based off your internal coding conventions, your organization's pipeline, if you have any special flags set up in place, if there's anything else you need to think about, this may be something that does need to be queried to determine, you know, is it flushing? Is that something that you look at that you need to flag, you know? So just to give um, an example of how everyone may handle, you know, the term a little bit differently, depending on your organization and, and the pipeline, et cetera. So with that being said, that's the end of the example, my first example. Samina, are there any questions or did you have anything to add to this? Uh, there are no questions for this particular exercise. Okay, great. So we'll move on to um, example two. So we'll go through this one a little quickly because I do see it's 12.07. I want to get to my third example. And this one should be fairly straightforward. We'll see. Um, so the patient experienced nausea after a round of chemotherapy. So is this term... Uh, clear enough to code. So when receiving a term with multiple concepts included, the first thing I always try to do is determine, can this term be coded or does it need to be split? So the first instinct is to browse Medra to see if there is a term available to capture both concepts, right? That, that would be my first instinct, since I would say, hey, maybe this does need to be split. Do we need to capture different things? So I put the QR code up, which means we're coming to a poll. Okay, so please use your browser to provide the closest match for what you can find. Provide your thoughts. Can this be a single LLT or multiple LLTs needed? Should we query? Okay, I see everyone's finding found nausea post chemotherapy, which Samina, that's a testament to you too for showing everyone the browser earlier, getting more in depth. Thank yeah, you. I, I gave secret slips of the answers for your exercises. <laughs> So very good. This is unanimous, which I thought it would be. Um, Excellent work. So a lot of people are aware that there are, you know, a combination terms of XAE post chemotherapy. So that's very good. Yes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to keep this open. Very good. Uh, and pull up the browser. We're going to do a nausea chemo here. And there we see everybody is correct. We have a nausea post chemotherapy. We'll go to browser here. I did see one LLT pop up of chemotherapy induced nausea, which um, that, that's an interesting one since it's not in the browser. So I'm not sure if it's just a, um, a suggestion, but there, the one that we see here, the LLT that is available is nausea post chemotherapy, which basically encompasses both concepts. Um, of the term. So in this case, we see the answers are still coming good. We browse. So 
what is important to remember here is that when you get a term like this, one of the first things to do is to kind of think like, do I need to split this or can I use my browser to find a term that captures all concepts? And as we know, at this point, this was pretty straightforward. Um, the correct answer is nausea post chemotherapy. So it's straightforward, but the takeaway again, at first glance, you may think the term needs to be split, but once you, you look uh, upon browsing, you can find that we do have a term available to capture both concepts. So I know I went through that a little quickly, but were there any questions or comments around that one? It's fairly straightforward. So far, there are no questions about this example. Okay. All right, great. We'll move on to example three my example for example seven. So this example is patient had a cough and fever due to confirmed Omicron infection. So is this verbatim clear enough to code? Again, we ask ourselves these four questions are good questions to always keep in your mind. What is, being, what is actually being reported? What is the most appropriate LLT and do we need to split? Those are always really good things to ask yourself upon beginning of coding anything that may be a little bit more complex or not as straightforward as say the last example. So as you can see, this term contains multiple concepts that may need to be looked at. So what do we know? Like just from looking at this term, we know that the patient had a cough, we know that the patient had a fever, and we know that the patient had, has confirmed Omicron infection, which is very current, you know, especially uh, towards the end of 2021, um, very relevant for the time. So with that being said, I'm gonna do another poll. And this time, I'm going to give you some choices. So what would you, on your initial um, look at this term, what would you say? Where would you say to code? Okay, so right now, we're seeing very heavy on the Omicron variant infection. Just a little bit, a couple people on A, some people with D to capture the, the symptoms of the infection. No one chose B, poor B. Nobody chose B, nobody chose E either, Samina. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with that being said, it looks like right now 93% of you are choosing the Omicron variant infection. So it's gonna be interesting to dive a little deeper into this and see what we can come up with. Okay, so let's break down these choices. So the first choice was the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So basically COVID-19 infection. So this is considered the same as say the Omicron infection where the Omicron is a variant of it. So, so this choice actually is a really good one. It may be a contender, right? Because it contains partial information related to the infection, although it's not Omicron specific, right? Um, and remember, uh, we have to keep in mind also that, you know, Omicron is fairly new variant of, of COVID. So, um, you know, we'll keep this one in the back of our, in our back pocket, as I like to say, <laughs> and see what happens as we go through the choices. So uh, the next choice that nobody, sadly, nobody chose was asymptomatic COVID-19. So that's, I would agree with everyone. No one chose it for a reason, right? Because it says asymptomatic, which I think we're all aware that when you say asymptomatic, it means you had zero symptoms, which if you have a fever and a cough and it's directly related to COVID, you have symptoms. So this LLT can be ruled out. So everyone was correct in their zero um, choice of that. Okay, so here's the third choice. So this was fever and cough. And I did see at the end of the poll, a couple people did choose um, this option of fever, LLT fever and LLT cough. So let's take a closer look at these two. Okay, so let's break this down. I'm gonna just pull up my whole slide. Okay, so when a term is received that contains multiple concepts, those concepts should be looked into a little bit further, right? So if you're not sure how to handle such a term, it's always best to reference your organization's internal coding conventions, which should you know, be based off of the points to consider. That's what we recommend um, to do. So you build your internal coding conventions, you base them off the points to consider. If you don't have internal coding conventions, or if you're sitting there saying, what's an internal coding convention? I have no idea if my organization has it, you know, what they are, what they could be. 
then it's always a good idea to reference the points to consider. As Samina showed you earlier, um, how you can reference it. I can show you again if everybody would like to see um, how to get there, but it's always good to just check the points to consider. And in this case, we went to the point, I went to the points to consider, and I took a couple screenshots of what could be directly related to this example. So in this case, we had a single definitive diagnosis, right? Because it was a confirmed Omicron infection. We also had some signs and symptoms available of fever and cough. So the preferred option according to the points to consider would be code the Omicron infection or the COVID infection or the SARS-2 code, whatever, you, whatever synonym you want to use to refer to it as, that would be our preferred option according to our points to consider. Now, it's important to note, there's also an alternative available where you can code the diagnosis, so the, the Omicron infection, the COVID infection, and also the signs and symptoms. Again, this could be different for every organization. It also could differ between clinical and safety, as in clinical, as we already discussed, if you need to split this term to say, break out the signs and symptoms, if that's what your organization chose to, chooses to do, you would have to send a query. Whereas in post-marketing, there may be options to use a slider to kind of record the symptoms, or you know, you can break it out in different ways. Maybe some organizations might use parentheses attached to the term, et cetera. So this is just to show how we would handle that choice that was available. So with that being said, let's break down the choices, the rest of the choices. So the next one, was COVID-19 virus test positive. So again, uh, nobody chose this one, <laughs> got a zero in our poll. And that's a, a, good, a good thing because as we're all aware and everybody interpreted it the same, that it was not focusing on the virus test positive. It did cover the, while this con covers the confirmed part, the, the term itself didn't specifically mention a positive test. It was more conveying the fever and cough related to the Omicron infection. So that was a good thing that, that no one chose that one. And now here's our last example, which was the runaway winner in the poll. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant infection. So this same term seems to be the perfect choice. It encompasses the Omicron infection. According to the PTC, that would be okay to code the single diagnosis if that's how your organization chooses to do it. So with that said, let's examine this a little further. We're gonna browse. And this time, I'm going to use the web-based browser. So here we can see um, it's, it's already set to version 25, the browser, because I don't know if everyone's aware, maybe not everyone on the call is aware, but today we released our 25, our version 25 files. That does not mean 25 is in effect. We still have eight weeks till it's in effect. But right now, if you go to the web-based browser, those files are available, version 25, all the new terms that were released are available in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch this to our current version so we can take a look at these terms in current versions since we will be using version 25 for another couple of weeks, right? So I set the browser up how I like to use it. I, I'm just gonna search here at the PT level. I don't wanna see categories. And I'm gonna type in Omicron. Actually, we'll start with, with COVID, right? And we'll just see what what's available. Let me open this. Okay, so as we go through, there's our asymptomatic that nobody chose. We can see there's tons of COVID terms available now. COVID-19, we see our pneumonia. None of these really are a perfect, perfect fit. Just maybe we'll look at regular COVID-19. We'll go to the browser. We'll double click here. We'll scroll down. Okay, here we go. So we can see there's our SARS-CoV-2 infection that was available as one of our choices. Okay, so that's good to know. You know, it's there, it's under COVID-19, we have it. Now you might be saying, well, where was that last choice that, that I had up in the, in the poll, right? So we'll type in Omicron and see what comes up. So, oh, nothing. And you're saying, how could that be possible? You know, is an LLT available? Now, what I wanted to mention here, the point being in this case, the Omicron variant, like I said, it's fairly new. It just started coming around end of last year and then you know, taking over 
many locations in the world uh, as the dominant variant, right? And, and we are still currently on version 24.1, which was released in the fall before this all happened. So what I'm gonna do here is we have um, our, we wanna go to our supplemental. Um, we restored default, defaults. Yeah, let me restore the defaults. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Samina. Um, we're gonna go and browse in the supplemental release, which is no one's aware. Um, this is where you can see what's coming down the pipeline. For terms you'll know that you're in the supplemental release when the screen turns pink back here so take away the non currents and now i'm just going to do a quick omicron search see what pops up so as you could see here's our term it's our it's available but it's not going to be available until may when the version 25 becomes current so i just wanted to show this and you could see here if you if you click here and you open the history, you can see that this term is brand new in version 25. So now what does that mean? What should we do at this point? We have a great match, a perfect match actually for this term. Um, you know, uh, regardless of if we're gonna code the signs and symptoms in addition to the infection or not, but it's not quite available yet. So what do we do? How do we handle it? So in this case, we will, we will mark it for future update. To, so we, since it's not available at this moment, we would have to code to the current term, the best term available. Let me actually switch to my next slide. Oh, it's a pull. But since, since it's not available, we would have to mark this term for future updates. So it, we would have to code it to something that is available at the time. So as we all picked uh, the Omicron variant, Right now, we couldn't actually code it to that because we're not all currently on version 25, but it's in the pipeline. So we know that we can code it to say a COVID-19 type term, and then in the future, we'll have it available to, for when we up version our dictionary, it will be available for coding. Um, so that's another thing uh, to keep in mind. Okay. So now, with that being said, our final suggestion, would be the SARS-CoV-2 infection, as I mentioned, because currently that is what we have. And also keep in mind that, like we mentioned, your organization may also wanna want to, or in their conventions may have, that they look at the cough and fever as the signs and symptoms. So they may need to be split out or um, added as sliders uh, and coded in addition to the infection. So that depends on your organization's conventions. And then during upversioning, uh, please consider updating the coding. As we know now, a better LLT is available in version 25. So this really shows um, how important it is to kind of keep up with the versions as they come out of MEDRA, because especially in this day and age with COVID and Omicron and everything happening basically on a daily basis, something new, we're all getting a new guidance or a new, new um, stuff is coming out about COVID. So it, it's, it's very important to try to keep your organization up to date with the current version of Medra with each release. And in this case, it would be very important because you would be able to capture that it was actually the Omicron infection and not just a COVID-19 uh, infection. So there we go. Okay, so now we're gonna do another poll related to this term. So I would like to hear from you all on how would your organization handle this term? With I know I gave a lot of information, but just keep in mind the, the main points I tried to make about having, not having a term out. You, this is, again, it's a free form response. You can type anything. You don't have to type in LLT. I would just like to know how your organization would handle this term. So uh, after going through the exercise, would you split it? Would you code it to the SARS-CoV-2 infection and then update it when version 25 is implemented? Would you, um, all, you know, also split out and code the, the cough and the fever? Would you um, co-manifest it? You know, how, how would you handle this? We're just interested. I just want to know to give everybody an idea of how maybe the different organizations uh, may handle this. 
And if you don't know how your organization would handle it, that's fine as well. You can just state that. And maybe it's something you can take, take as a learning um, point from this presentation and, and uh, you know, go back to your people within your organization and see if you could come up with a convention or see if there is already one in place on how you would kind of handle this. So we're seeing, Samina, lots of different options, right? Yeah, most, most people would, uh, you know, code with available uh, version term and then upgrade later, make a note, just as you suggested. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. So it's good to know that a lot of people are upversioning and would go through and, uh, and do that upon when, it, when the new version is released. Let's see if there's anything else. Okay. There's no questions so far about this. Oh, good. All right. Maybe it's also because I'm using a free form. People maybe can, mm -hmm. okay. or maybe <laughs> hopefully not everyone's confused. And uh, what is she talking about? <laughs> but I think this was a good, a good example to show, um, you know, at first, at first jump, when we did the first poll, right? Thinking back, everybody was coding to the Omicron, right? And it's, that's why it's so important to, Kind of use your browser make sure you're using the current version of the browser and then go through and see what's available and if it's not available you can check the supplemental portion of the browser and kind of see what's going to come in the pipeline so all right well thank you all Asmina, did you have anything to add no i think this was a very good demonstration of uh, possible supplemental terms and a good point of how to use a term that you know that is coming up that you need uh, with what's available. So I think that's the take home message. Yeah, thank you. So I know we're, we're a little, you know, um, we go through it a little fast, but you know, you can always feel free to ask questions. We'll get back to you afterwards. And I do see it's 1226, so I don't want to keep everyone past. Uh, I know how busy everyone is. So what we're going to do is we're going to save my next example for the next time we teach. And uh, we're going to go straight into the, the conclusions so that we have a chance because we do want to give you all a chance um, to give us some suggestions comments you can give us here now is your chance um, Samina if you want to add anything they can give us uh, terms that you would like us to look at topics if you want to see um, a re uh, coding examples around a certain topic if you think we need to go a little bit uh, more in depth on certain topics, just if you could provide any feedback would be greatly appreciated that you can provide here and we'll take that and we will use it for our next session. Yeah, um, I, I see uh, in the question panel a suggestion for a potential, uh, you know, example, verbatim example for our next session. We certainly will take that into account. Great. And then for free form, as Nicole mentioned, you, you know, feel free if you have prepared short verbatim or a concept you'd like to uh, describe more in future sessions, please go ahead and enter that now. Uh, I'm not sure. Is hopefully it's working because oh maybe not. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay, so we want more big terms. Okay, exaggerations. The new go through the new PTC concepts. Okay. Yeah, I would like to mention here that we have um, a webinar as well as a workshop solely dedicated to medication errors. So do look on our training page if you are specifically interested in medication error type terminology and approaches, we, we have something dedicated solely to that. So do check our training page for the next available webinar around that topic. Okay, so I, lots of people are, are very interested in medication errors. So that's a that's always, you know, um, I didn't mention, but I've just came out of industry. I was in coding most of my career in industry. So working in pharma and biotech and, and that was always such a hot topic. Um, so. Yeah, we have a wonderful job that uh, some of my colleagues, as well as, um, you know, I also do that session. Uh, we give you uh, organization charts, a decision tree of how to, uh, you know, define medication error and what the various challenges are. So I would definitely recommend you to check that out on, on the next available uh, session that's being provided. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing we're getting some good examples. So I'm actually going to, um, I want to leave this open and uh, we'll go through. Uh, We'll let this stay for like another minute and then we'll close it out because I, I want to make sure we get everybody's feedback and everybody's um, suggestions for terms that we, Samina and I will, will, will try to incorporate. Obviously, we're not going to be able to incorporate them all in the next, but we have a couple future trainings coming. So we'll make sure that we, um, we try to do as many as we can.
Certainly. And that's that's the whole point of these let's get uh, yeah. code together sessions. We definitely want to take those things that are most challenging for you, yeah. topics of concern, uh, challenging areas, and we definitely will present on those topics that suggested by you. Yes. And since we can't be in person, because if we were in person, we can all have discussions on this and, and be able to talk to each other and go through it. But since we can't, we're hoping that you enjoyed our polls and, um, you know, trying to keep it interactive for you, for you all today. Um, okay, so we're getting some good ones here. So, yeah, to keep yes. in mind. Very our big ones. Cut out for us. <laughs> um, it certainly is. And, uh, you know, we'll have to. We'll have to do some research probably to come up with even ways to, to search these and to see if we can even come up with an answer for some of these. All oh, right. yeah. and, and we're getting some positive feedback that just absolutely makes our day. Thank you so much for the positive feedback yes. as well. Really appreciate, we appreciate it. it. We do appreciate it because uh, we want to make sure that we're doing the best we can for you guys. Uh, that, that's our whole point of being here today, not to hear ourselves talk. <laughs> we want to make sure that we're giving you information you can take back to your organization and share with your colleagues and maybe, you know, just, you know, continue the, the conversation as we say afterwards. All right, so right now it's 1230. I don't want to keep, I just thank you all for the feedback. Like I said, we'll, we have this saved. We will um, go through. There is certification, Liz mentioned it at the beginning. It will be provided within a couple of days of this class and terminating. I do wanna be able to show you these, these um, uh, slides. It's all our all helpful information for the browsers we went through today for our frequently, if you wanna have some frequently asked questions, if you need help, you can email the MSSO help desk, our website. Then we have our training schedule. As Samina mentioned, she does do uh, medication errors part one and part two. Part two is a workshop. And there are several other trainers that also work on medication errors uh, workshops available. We have more Let's Code Together classes. We have many, many classes. So you can look and sign up and you know, interact with us uh, virtually as we are for now and hopefully soon enough face-to-face. We have supporting documentation. And then most important on the bottom, we have our YouTube channel where this presentation that you saw today will be recorded and, and it will be stored on this uh, YouTube channel. And you'll be able to go back and listen to it, either pieces of it, you could fast forward if you want to, and, and, and just in, uh, go back and re-reference the examples and the information we gave you today. We're not providing slides because as you saw, our slides were very vague and obscure. We had mainly polls and just a couple pieces of information we touched upon. So the best thing to do is to go to the YouTube channel and listen back or give the link to your colleagues if you think they would benefit from this. Um, we'll have Liz or someone send out these last two slides with the, with the websites on them uh, at the conclusion of this presentation. Um, and we just wanna thank you very much because we know how busy everyone is for taking the time out of your day to join us. And uh, Samina, I don't know if you want to give a big thank you before we go sign off. Absolutely. Just uh, for some people, you just go on our website, uh, www.medra.org, go to contact, and that's where you'll see the little YouTube channel uh, sign where you can quickly link for uh, accessing this presentation. So from all of us here at the MSSO, thank you very much for joining, and until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you.